Today we're going to be reviewing the all new Ford Escape. Now while most car reviewers would complain how the Escape has definitely softened up over the years, we're going to be taking a look under the hood and underneath this vehicle to see what's inside and how it works. And we're going to start under the hood where we have Ford's Dragon 1.5 liter 3 cylinder turbocharged EcoBoost engine situated transversely for front wheel drive. Yep, that's right, the volume engine on the Ford Escape is a 3 cylinder engine. Ford has moved away from the 4 cylinder 1.5 and gone to a 3 cylinder 1.5 which is enlarges the piston diameter. There Therefore, giving you more torque. Now taking a look at the layout of this engine bay, we have the air intake on this side which leads back down to the turbocharger behind the engine. On this side here we have the coolant and windshield washer reservoirs and on this side here we have the battery, brake booster and ECU. Now underneath all this foam that's holding these wires together we have a metal valve cover which is pretty rare on a modern vehicle, usually they're just made of plastic. Now this engine does use 5W20 weight oil. Now on top of the engine we have the three ignition coils and spark plugs which are fairly easy to access once you move these vacuum lines out of the way. Now this engine does have its intake side on the front and the exhaust side on the rear. Now this engine has both direct and port gasoline injection. Now fuel is going to come in from the tank over here to this high pressure pump and get pressurized and sent down to this fuel rail underneath this foam here directly into the combustion chamber. Now this engine also has port injection which means that this line goes to this fuel rail here to the three injectors for the port injection. This is great because it's going to prevent carbon buildup on the intake valves. We've also got the fuel pressure sensor for the rail here. Now this being a turbocharged engine, the air intake setup is quite unique. Air begins its journey at the front here where it's then sent into the air box to get filtered out. We have the mass airflow sensor here. It is then sent down behind the engine to the turbocharger to get boosted. And you can see how that pipe runs behind the engine down to the turbocharger. Now the charged air pipe will bring boosted air down from the turbocharger down this frame rail here and into the air to air intercooler located just behind the radiator. Once the air is cooled off it will then come through this pipe and then come up to this drive by wire throttle body and then go into this plastic intake plenum before going down into the engine head to get burned. We've got another air sensor on this side. Look how tiny this air intake is to the throttle body. And on this side here we've got another sensor. Now changing the air filter on the Escape is pretty easy. Just these two tabs here. And then I can lift out the air filter. Now with the air box removed you can see we've got clear access to this side of the engine. Over here we have the EcoBoost pressure solenoid which will send boost air back into this intake before going back down into the turbocharger. Now on the passenger side of the engine underneath this timing cover we have a timing belt which is something you don't see that often. Most many Manufacturers have moved to a chain driven design. What's even more interesting is that this belt is dipped in engine oil to help lubricate it and also keep things quiet. Furthermore, there's no mention of changing the timing belt in the maintenance manual of this vehicle, which kind of gives you an idea of how long they expect this engine to last. Now the shape of the timing cover also integrates itself into the engine mount. So if you ever got to do any timing work on this engine, you're going to either have to remove the engine completely or support it some other way. Now the drive belts are pretty easy to access on this engine because it's a three cylinder engine. There's a lot of room to work inside of here. At the back there we have the tensioner and at the front here we have the alternator. It's got this little plastic shroud on it to prevent your hair from getting tangled inside of there when you bend over. At the front here we have the alternator which is pretty easy to access. Just two bolts and it should come right out. Now this engine has variable valve timing which is electrically controlled over here. We've also got the PCV valve as they lead back to the intake. Now what's also unique to this engine is that it can turn off the intake and exhaust valve for each cylinder independently of each other for cylinder deactivation as if three cylinders weren't too few. Now we're going to take a look at the cooling system on the Ford Escape starting here at the coolant jug where we have the radiator cap. It's just made of plastic and it's kind of flimsy. We've got a couple of hoses that come across the front of the engine here and the radiator up at the front here. Now the water pump is driven off of the accessory belt. Now some of these coolant hoses are going to lead up to this junction here which goes into a plastic thermostat housing before going into the back of the water pump. And here's another look at that plastic thermostat housing from underneath. Now the Escape uses one giant plastic radiator fan in behind the radiator. Now on the driver's side of the engine we have the upper radiator hose where it goes into the engine and we have two accessory hoses that go into the heater core. Now some of that coolant comes down to this auxiliary electric water pump which circulates coolant throughout the system after you shut off the engine for even engine coolant which is pretty important on turbocharged engines. Now some of that coolant will also make its way to the oil cooler located behind the oil filter. Now that auxiliary water pump also allows the heater to work although the start stop system is engaged. Now inside the front bumper the Escape has active grill shutters which will close these flaps here in order to give you better aerodynamics and cooling efficiency on both the lower and the upper grille. Now overall this engine has more coolant and vacuum hoses than wires sprawled everywhere. Here we have the battery and just beside it we have this ECU. Now I don't like how this ECU is located so close to the outside edge of the vehicle because if you get into one little accident it's going to be a pretty easy write-off especially saying that they want you to scrap it if you just drop it. Now one thing I don't like under the hood of the new Escape is how a lot of hoses and wires are not tied up properly and instead 
said, just tied to each other. Look at this fuel line over here. It's barely being held up by its stiffness and this little slot and a piece of foam, as well as a lot of these other vacuum lines and coolant lines. They could have tidied this up a lot better. Now the underbody of the new Ford Escape is fairly flat and most of it is covered with plastic with the exception of the exhaust. Now one of the biggest oversights is that you have to remove this entire plastic panel consisting of over a dozen fasteners in order to access the oil pan to change the oil. I can see a lot of those fasteners getting lost over time. At least they include a fancy duct here to cool off the transfer gate. Now here we are underneath the Ford Escape. We have the transmission on the driver's side and the oil pan and engine on the passenger side. Now changing oil on the Escape is pretty easy. We have the drain plug and a canister style oil filter. Now Ford has attempted to reduce vibrations by integrating the oil pump with a balanced shaft just above the oil pan underneath the crank. Now perhaps my biggest issue with the three cylinder engine is when you put the vehicle in drive you could feel vibrations all over the steering wheel and in the seat. It's not really a very well refined engine. Perhaps a bit difficult to see but this engine is vibrating quite a lot at idle. Now the AC compressor is accessed from the bottom and it's pretty easy to remove once you get all these hoses out of the way. Now with the air box removed you can see we've got clear access to the transmission which is Ford's 8F 8-speed automatic transmission and it's actually based off of a 9-speed GM transmission. Now just at the front of the transmission underneath this plastic cover is the valve body and you can see we've got its electrical connectors inside of here. Now just in behind the fog light is the transmission computer which is a bit of an oversight because one little tap on your front bumper and that expensive transmission computer is toast. Now because this transmission is electronically shifted it's got this little emergency pull tab here to pull it out of park in case it dies and you got to tow it to the scrapyard. Now that emergency release will come here to the top of the transmission where it'll disengage the parking pile through this lever. Now just underneath the battery on the top of the transmission we have this vent and if you pull off the cover it becomes the fill port for the transmission. Now this is a brand new vehicle and you can already see that it's been leaking which isn't really good. Now the starter on the escape is located just underneath this area intake and once we move all these hoses and wires out of the way we should be able to access it pretty easy. Now we do have what appears to be another starter at the back here just beside the battery for the start stop system. Now here's what the transmission looks like from below. Now this is the all-wheel drive model which means that we have the transfer case here and the axles that go out to either front wheel. Now the transfer case has a drain port on the bottom and a fill port on the side here to change the oil. Now the all-wheel drive system has this electric disconnect motor that will disengage the rest of the all-wheel drive system to save fuel. Now the transfer case is responsible for taking some of the transverse power off of the transmission and sending it down through this drive shaft down the middle of the vehicle to the rear differential. And that drive shaft is going to lead up to this rear differential before it splits power to the rear wheel. Now on the bottom we have the drain plug for the transmission fluid. And just underneath the driver's side axle we have the overfill plug in order to set the correct fluid level because this, this transmission does not have a dipstick. Now the transmission has its own warmer where we have hot engine coolant that exchanges its heat with the transmission fluid. Now the transmission also has a cooler which goes through these lines here and takes transmission fluid out to the cooler in front of the radiator. And the transmission cooler is located just in front of the radiator in behind the condenser. Now the rear differential has got its drain port and a fill port to change its fluid. Now also part of that all-wheel drive disconnect feature is this electric motor on the top of the rear differential. Now these rear axles are pretty chunky for a front drive vehicle. It should be enough to tow a couple of shopping carts and strollers behind you at the mall. Here we've got a nice chunky drive shaft and it comes down to this really small neck here before it goes into the rear differential. My guess is this is a design feature to allow it to break here before it breaks anywhere else especially when you're trying to crawl over that little hill at soccer practice. Now this engine does have two main mounts, one on the passenger side where it connects to the timing cover and one on the driver's side where it bolts to the transmission just underneath that battery. Additionally on the bottom of the transmission we have the torque mount. Now Ford does use nylock knots in most of its structural parts which are one time use and Ford does ask you to replace them anytime you remove them so make note of that anytime you have to do work on this car. Now the front suspension setup on the Escape uses a McPherson style strut that goes into a steel steering knuckle. Now at the top here we have the stabilizer link as it connects to the sway bar down here. We have the inner and outer tie rods as well as a forged aluminum lower control arm. Again you'll notice nylock nuts are used which means you got to replace them every time you do an alignment. Now the lower ball joint on the Ford Escape is not replaceable and is integrated into the control arm and it uses a pinch bolt design which could sometimes get stuck compared to a bolt on design when it comes time to replacement. We've also pulled a German and used a Torx fastener on this pinch bolt. Now since this is a steel knuckle Ford has still opted to use a Preston style bearing which means that you're going to need a press in order to change this bearing. There's no easy bolt-on options here. With a simple McPherson suspension setup, you think changing the control arms in this Ford should be pretty easy. This bolt is pretty easy to get off, but the bolt on the front here 
is locked into the subframe. Yep, that's right. There's no access to this bolt from either side. You have to unbolt the front half of this frame here in order to get access to that bolt. Now taking a look from underneath, if you unbolt that frame, it leads up to the radiator support at the front here, which means that the entire front clip has to be removed in order to change a control arm. Now, overall, Ford took what was supposed to be a simple suspension setup and just made it a lot more complicated and harder to work on when things wear out. Now while the Escape does not have a strut tower, nor is there one integrated into the windshield cap, it's interesting to know where these strut towers are relative to the outside fenders of the vehicle so much so that they're able to stuff a windshield washer bottle on this side and have a huge gap on this side here so much so that the frame is so inside compared to the outside of the vehicle as it goes all the way down all this ends up to be a crumple space in your small overlap crash test now the Ford Escape uses a rear multi-link independent suspension design here we have the strut where it attaches to the rear lower control arm along with the spring on the same control arm and then at the front here we have an upper control arm a forward control arm and then this control blade now just behind the control blade we have the stabilizer link where it attaches to the sway bar and here's another look at that suspension from the back the knuckles themselves are made of steel but the hubs are bolted on which is good for easy bearing replacement surprisingly though both subframes on the front and the back are made of steel I'm surprised they didn't use aluminum since they've lightweighted this generation escape so much now I notice this Ford Escape has a really loud sound coming from the back when I gas it on turns oh that sounds bad I don't know what that is, it sounds terrible. Now just on the firewall we have the brake reservoir and just behind that we have the master cylinder and brake booster combo. Now this isn't your typical brake booster, it's not vacuum powered, in fact it's electronically powered through this motor over here that gives you that braking assist. The motor on this side here is your ABS motor and you can see we've got four lines that go directly to the wheel. There's no need for any splitters or extra lines or proportioning valve, it's all electronically controlled now. Now the main advantage to an electric brake actuator is that you can integrate all of the safety systems directly into this unit you can also use the brakes when the engine is in start stop mode or hybrid mode and the engine is off now speaking of safety systems the radar sensor is located way at the bottom of the bumper down here where it's susceptible to shopping cart damage at your local shopping mall instead of up here on behind the emblem like some other manufacturers do now the front brakes just use a single piston floating caliper design on a disc rotor and are surprisingly small for an SUV now the rear brakes also use a single piston floating caliper on a disc rotor and are surprisingly about the same size as the front brake pads. At the top here we have the electric parking brake actuator and what's interesting is this rotor is coated in plastic which is great because it won't rust and look bad through your alloy wheels. Now here's a look at the electric steering rack on the Ford Escape. There is no motor located here. In fact it's located on the steering column. If you look closely you can see the electric steering motor underneath the dash. Now one thing with this start stop system although we have electric power steering is that the electric power steering itself doesn't work although it still could be powered by battery. With the engine cut off here if I turn it it'll actually turn the car on and then I get assist. Now I can understand if you had hydraulic steering and it was dependent on the engine but since it's electric steering it should allow me to maneuver my wheel and then take off. Now the exhaust system on the Ford Escape starts in the head itself where we have the integrated exhaust manifold. The turbocharger bolts directly to the head and it then heads down the downpipe. Now after the turbocharger the exhaust will come through this catalytic converter and then head down to the back. The exhaust will then head to another catalytic converter and then through this long midpipe here all the way to the back. At the back the exhaust will go under the rear differential and straight into a dual outlet muffler. The EVAP canister in the Escape is located inside the right side rear bumper. Now the fuel tank in the Escape looks pretty big, but it is made of plastic and they do offer different capabilities depending if you've got the all-wheel drive system or not. It appears that there's an open vacuum line that goes to the fuel filler. Now this is right near the wheel and there's no filter on it, so any crud that goes in there could probably cause havoc. Now overall the build quality of the Ford Escape under the hood is fairly standard with what you find in most modern vehicles these days. However, it's interesting how Ford is taking risks with new technologies such as a 3 cylinder turbo engine and an electric brake booster and the reliability of this is still yet to be proven. What's interesting is how the Ford Escape has changed over the years. Just like it's styling, the engine has also softened up quite a bit. The old boxy Ford Escapes used to have a 3 liter V6 engine and this one literally has half of that with 1.5 liters and 3 cylinders. I guess you really can't call this an SUV anymore because it's just a taller all-wheel drive Ford Focus hatchback. And that's a wrap on the mechanicals of the 2020 Ford Escape. Now you tell me in the comment section down below what do you think of the new Ford Escape? Is it just another mall crawler or do you think Ford is onto something with what's under the hood? Now make sure you follow me on Instagram for more behind the scenes footage and subscribe for more videos just like this one.
Seems like the software in the Ford Escape is straight out of the Ford Explorer.